with Hashem's loving grace, we're now up to principle 12, learning about Mashiach and the path to Mashiach. And this is our 12th principle, next to last principle, 12th of the 13 principles. I believe with complete belief in the coming of Messiah, Mashiach. And even though he tarries, I will none the west await him every day whenever he comes. So we believe that Mashiach, once again, the Messiah, I mean, before the Mashiach, okay, but for those who don't know, Mashiach means Messiah. Where does the word Mashiach comes from? Mashiach means the anointed, literally he was the anointed. That's the anointed king. King David was an anointed king. When Hashem sent Samuel the prophet to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons, and Hashem said to the Samuel prophet, I will show you which of the son is, okay? He took out a vial of olive oil and he anointed King David on the head and the oil came down between that. This is the anointed king. To anoint in Hebrew is lim shoach. So an anointed one means Mashiach. So the word Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, anointed one. King David was the anointed king of Israel. Later, there were kings that were not anointed, but King David was one of the anointed. King Solomon was anointed. Okay, so the house of David, the anointed kings of Israel. And we'll learn that the Sion of David, the ancestor of David, is Mashiach, that we hope he's fast on the way. So we believe that Mashiach has not yet come, but he... We eagerly, even though he's not here, we eagerly anticipate his arrival together with the advent of everything that comes along with the Messianic era that we'll learn that tonight, which includes the Geula. You heard me say the word a lot. Geula means the full redemption of our people and the ingathering the exiles and to our holy homeland of Israel and the rebuilding of our holy temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. If someone comes along, and they say, oh, we're going to build a temple to Hashem in Rome or in Golders Green or in Burra Park. No, it must be, as we learn, the Rambam stipulates the temple to Hashem rebuild it must be on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Until that's done, that's not the real deal. So, so much has been said and written all about Mashiach and Geula throughout the years. And a lot of it is not authoritative. Okay. And a lot of it is not in accordance with Torah and Masorah, that we learn Masorah is tradition. Okay, so to now, we're going to learn what is in tradition, what we do believe in, what is codified. And this is most of tonight's lessons based on the teachings of Maimonides, the Rambam. Okay, Maimonides, in the laws of kings, Hilchos Malochim, he disperses all the myths and he clarifies the truth. Okay, but, but people, a lot of people that say, oh, Mashiach, 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 and they forget, they never learned the Rambam. They don't learn. So we're, tonight we're going to learn some amazing information. We're going to learn about our belief in Mashiach. We're going to learn who is Mashiach, how we know, how we can recognize Mashiach. And we're going to learn what the Messianic times are going to be like. Well, what can we expect with Mashiach? What's going to be? So in his elaboration of the Mishnah, the Rambam writes, this is the words of the Rambam, we are obliged to believe in the coming of Mashiach and not to think that it will be delayed. Don't think that even though Mashiach is here, it's going to be delayed. No, come. Even though Mashiach tarries, we nonetheless await him. It's like a, a guest. We look forward. We don't know when he's going to come. But we think any moment he's going to come through the door. This is the way that Torah observant people throughout history waited for Mashiach whenever he comes. Whenever he comes. Okay. So now... Very important. I'm going to stress this a half a dozen times, maybe more. A person should await Mashiach and not speculate about the time of Mashiach's coming. Don't predict. Don't speculate. Okay. And don't look for proofs in Torah that seemingly say when he's going to come. A lot of people do that. They think that with the Torah codes are certain. This, so Mashiach doesn't come here. Mashiach doesn't come there. Because our sages say there's a curse in the Gemara. In, our, our sages don't curse. Because their words, they know their words are very powerful. But in Tractate Sanhedrin 96a, our sages say, may the breathing of those who calculate the end cease. Oh, they, should, they should stop breathing. Why, why is this? What, what's, what's going on with this curse? Okay, Caesar, what's wrong? I speculate, Mashiach, what's wrong if I say, okay, he's going to come by next Rosh Hashanah or come by here or come by there? What's wrong with that? You ask yourselves, 
are gentle. If we look at the sages that made a curse, gentle, peace-loving sages. What do they utter such a fierce curse for? What's, what's behind this? Okay, so it's an amazing question. I heard an answer from Rabbi Israel Tauber, saintly and blessed memory. I don't know if you know Rabbi Israel Tauber. He passed away last year, two years ago. He was a tremendous scholar, tremendous, tremendous scholar, and he was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, Rav Tauber came from Hungary, and he was a six-year-old boy in the Holocaust, and what did he saw. So he's, he's, he himself, he explains like this. He says, when he was a little boy in the Holocaust, uh, he, did, he came up in a very important family, this and that. And even as a little boy, he already knew the principles of Amuna. And he said, what gave him the strength to endure the Holocaust as a little boy and seeing all these horrors all around him and hunger and this and, and before they were in the camps that they were running every night that they slept somewhere else and running away from the Nazis and hiding here and hiding there. It's such a, you can't, can't believe a nightmare that a, a six, seven year old boy has to, has to go through. He says, what gave us the, 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 the strength to endure the pure purgatory, the Holocaust was the belief in Mashiach. Okay, I can hold on. Mashiach's gonna come in another minute. I can hold on for another minute. Okay, that minute passed. Mashiach gonna come another minute. Hashem's gonna say Mashiach and, and, and we're gonna get rescued. Hold on another minute. So Rabbi Tauber explains that this anticipation, this hope for Mashiach and the Geula and salvation, Yeshua, okay. He said, if somebody would have said, okay, hold on for a week. Mashiach will come next week. And would hold on for a whole week and the Mashiach doesn't come, it lost faith. It lost faith. And this is what happens. In light of Rabbi Tauber's explanation, we can understand how all the false messiahs in history caused so much damage. And it caused a breakdown of peace, of, of, of the breakdown of faith. Because the gullible people that didn't know the principles of a Mashiach and were fooled by a false messiah, they put all their hope in this deadline. Or else they thought he was already here because the guy, the, the fake Mashiach, says, <clears throat> I'm Mashiach. And they found out he wasn't. Then there a terrible breakdown of faith. And for that, once a cynic told me, it's, 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 it sounds like a little sick joke, but a cynic once told me that uh, the tobacco companies, they invest in false messiahs. I said, what are you talking about? What you get to sing? He says, you know why the tobacco fault companies felt... <clears throat> in false messiahs. He says he invested in false messiahs because after Messiah doesn't come, people have a breakdown in faith and they start smoking cigarettes on Shabbat and tobacco sales go up. <laughs> this is it's very cynical, but, but there's a lot, you know, within the, within this cynical joke, you can see uh, the, a lot of truth that every time we see people, look for, I see itself a breakdown of faith, a complete breakdown of faith when people say this guy's Mashiach or this guy not Mashiach or Mashiach hasn't come this year, he's come next year. And then you look back, it, it's enough with all the, the silliness going on around the web. How many people uh, want to enliven their hit counters by talking but can you know, speculate against Mashiach? But don't speculate against Mashiach because the person that speculates against Mashiach is playing Russian roulette with a curse from the Gomorrah. Okay, so the Rambam stresses, I don't like to mention curses, but here, here, this is cause a breakdown of faith. And we know that every time in Jewish, especially with Shabtai Tzvi, so many people believed in the Shabtai Tzvi movement. And this became, this was right before the Baal Shem Tov. So when the Baal Shem Tov came around, uh, people thought that the Hasidic movement was another false messianic movement. That's why the Misnagdim, those who opposed the Hasidic movement, they thought, well, this is just another messianic movement, which is completely not. Okay, the Hasidic movement, Baal Shem Tov, was to uplift the common Jew. There was there an elite of Torah scholars. And the Baal Shem Tov came to uplift the, the, the water carriers and the wagon drivers. And they too, they too can learn. They too can uh, say to Hillam and learn a page of Gomorrah. They too can be important. Okay, but this wasn't false. Because of the false Messiah, so many people, and what happened with Shabtai Tzvi, claimed he was Messiah in the end, he went to Istanbul, and he became an Islam. <laughs> he left Judaism altogether. So see, here's the Messiah that, 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 who holds himself as Jewish Messiah. And, and, and he completely, completely left the, left the fold. Left, 
It's crazy. So the Rambam stresses, even though Mashiach tarries, we nonetheless await him. And this is an integral part of our 12th principle. Our sages went to great lengths to prepare themselves for Mashiach and Geula. And once again, I stress, and if there's one thing tonight that we anticipate and we don't speculate, that's the, that it's worth this lesson. Just to anticipate and not speculate. One of the most important questions that the heavenly court asks a person, this is the Gemara tractate, Shabbat 31a. First thing, when a person goes up, the soul goes up after leaving this world, and now the soul is greeted by the heavenly court, and they say, welcome soul. And one of the first things that the soul is asked is, did you negotiate fairly? <laughs> negotiate fairly? It's a, did you do honest business? Okay, because this is an expression of a person's practical amuna. Some people, they talk a big game, but when it comes to money, no, they put the amuna aside. No, that's the first thing. The second thing they ask him is, did you anticipate salvation? So hold it. What's salvation? Salvation is a package deal. Our sages explain salvation is a package that includes Mashiach and everything that's going to happen in the Messianic times, which once again is Geula and the rebuilding of the Holy Temple and the gathering of the exiles. So therefore, the anticipation of salvation is synonymous to the anticipation of Mashiach because Mashiach is the catalyst that kicks the whole process of salvation and to being, we'll see it. Mashiach comes, Mashiach wants Mashiach. Now Mashiach is going to fight the wars of Hashem, and Mashiach is going to build a holy temple. So we see that Mashiach and salvation, the terms Yeshua and Mashiach, Mashiach and salvation are all the time juxtaposed, even in our daily Amida. In our daily Amida, we say three times a day, Mashiach and salvation are juxtaposed because we recite three times a day the Matzmiach Keren Yeshua blessing. And we say like this in English, speedily cause, we ask Hashem, Hashem speedily cause the sign of David, David's ancestor, your servant to flourish. He should come and increase his power by your salvation. Okay, you give him the power of salvation, for we hope for your salvation. Could you hope or anticipate? And we anticipate salvation. Oh, he said that the, the, the prayer says both. We hope for salvation and we anticipate salvation. So what's the difference? Okay, now we hope, we hope right now, we hope right now, and we anticipate that it's gonna come any second. Okay, that's a, uh, anticipating is even more than hoping. Hoping, yeah, we hope and anticipate. We really, we get ready to make sure that my, my, my Shabbat clothes, the clothes I'm gonna greet Mashiach, that they're, they're, they're laundered and they've been to the dry cleaner and they're hanging up nice iron and I'm ready to grab it from the, from the closet and they go out and, yeah, Mashiach is here and ready to meet Mashiach. Okay, this is it's anticipating Mashiach. So the sign of David, that's Mashiach. Because one thing the prophet Isaiah tells us, that Mashiach is going to be from the house of David, David's offspring. And our double expression, once more, of hoping for salvation while constantly anticipating, the hope is a general hope, and the anticipation is a constant anticipation that we say with intent. Now, this is why it's important. A lot of people, they dream through the Amida prayer and their mind wanders. But when they say Matzmiach uh, Kelen Yeshua blessing with intent, then they'll be able to answer in the heavenly court, yes, I did anticipate. And even if you don't say the Amida prayer, okay, even if you don't say a prayer like, uh, and if, if you have a Noahide prayer book, that's wonderful. But uh, if it, no eye prayers, no eye to personal prayer, Hashem, look at the world. The world's a mess. Hashem, we need salvation. We need Messiah. This is for all of humanity. I say redemption. It's not just redemption of Jewish people. We're Jewish people light unto the nations. We have to teach spirituality. But who do we teach it to? We teach it to all the nations. Because look what's happening in the world. <laughs> Political and, and medical and everything. The world is a mess. We need Mashiach so badly. And people thought everything was fun and games as long as I can go to the football game and do, do here and do there, go to this every time. Hashem has put an end to all that. And we see one mutation after another in the COVID, even though there's the, the vaccinations, one mutation after another. Hashem is showing, no, my beloved children, this time you cannot outsmart me because the time is coming very fast for Mashiach and I want people to come close to me. I want people to repent. I want people to learn Torah. I want people to 
increase their muna, to enhance their muna. And this is what Hashem wants because these are messianic times. Okay. So we beg Hashem daily for the wonderful happenings that come with the arrival of Mashiach, the redemption, and the gathering exiles, the correction of the world, and the rebuilding of our holy temple in Jerusalem. And I'll tell you something else. If the nations of the world knew the power of the holy temple, they would force us to build a holy temple. Because not only do Jews bring sacrifices to the holy temple, the nations of the world are welcome to bring sacrifices. And then when you bring sacrifices, for example, uh, suppose that the prime minister of the UK, uh, it comes and he brings a, a sacrifice. Only temple. That, that is a uh, atonement for, the, for, for all of Britain, for all the British Isles. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable the power of it. The British population would force their four men, their, their minister on his platform to have elections between uh, Labour and the Conservatives. Okay, who's going to be the first one to promise to send a sacrifice to the Holy Temple? Oh, you're a candidate for prime minister? And I'm sacrifice. I don't want you. You're not going to do anything for the people. Uh, but this, you know, the, the one that's going to support the, uh, the uh, Mashiach and, and the Holy Temple. It's gonna, if the nations of the world knew what the Holy Temple was, well, they'd force us to build it. Okay. So we're far from finished praying for, um, for uh, Mashiach in our Amida alone or in personal prayer. Look where else we do it all day long in grace after meals. We repeatedly ask for Mashiach and rebuilding Yerushalayim. Every time we say the Kaddish prayer, we say, Ba'galob is man kalif, speeding our time. It should all come speeding our days. In the Eleno prayer, we say three times a day. Uh, and every day, every day of the week, we, we, we pray for Mashiach. We say it four times on Shabbos. We beg Hashem to bring down his divine monarchy to the earth. So we say, so where's our Mashiach? But we said Mashiach is the catalyst for Hashem to bring down the divine monarchy to earth. Hashem will not bring down a divine monarchy until Mashiach comes. Mashiach triggers all this. Hashem will not build the holy temple until Mashiach comes. Hashem won't make an in-gathering in exiles until Mashiach comes. We have a trickle right now to get things ready. And you can see Hashem is saying, hey, listen, you know, like that the song, people get ready because the trains are coming. Old Curtis Mayfield song, way back from 1967. First year of university. What, what does this mean? Israel and the skies, Hashem's speaking to us everything. People don't look at the world's spiritual eyes. The skies of Israel are locked down. Nobody comes in, nobody comes out. So Hashem said, wait a second, don't think that you can come whenever you want to. You come when I, Hashem is saying that it's not, it's not up to I Bezrat Hashem, Bezrat Hashem, we'll make tshuva and we'll get past this and the skies will reopen. But uh, anybody wants to come, they're going to think about set their aliyah plans into action. Okay, so we're not finished. We're not finished. We're davening all the, all the time, Aleinu, Birkas Amazon, Kaddish, for all this salvation package. This salvation package. You could be a, a, a travel agent and sell Mashiach by on the salvation package. Okay, here's your, your journey to Israel and the, get the salvation package. Part of Mashiach, that, that which everybody will be a part of the salvation package. On Shabbos morning, we all cry out from bottom of our hearts during Kedusha. In the Kedusha, the height of this Shabbat morning prayers, and we cry, when will you reign in Zion? Matai timloch b'tzion. And we sing it, we sing it, and we sing it with a fervent, a fervent nigun, a fervent melody. When will you reign in Zion? We ask Hashem, when will you reign in Zion? Speedily in our days, you shall dwell among us forever. And with this, look at the world today. Person feels spiritually like, it's suffocating of the atmosphere, not just a pandemic, but the atmosphere of immorality and, and debauchery and agnosticism and corruption. Everywhere you go, and, and people, and, and this has become the norm. Someone who doesn't go along these lines is not politically correct. Okay. It's like we yearn for Mashiach, just like we yearn for fresh air. We're suffocating. Mashiach is fresh spiritual air. It's an air cleaner. Mashiach, he marks the beginning of Hashem's reign on earth. That's why we want him so badly. So our anticipation of Mashiach is so important that the Gemara says that anyone that doesn't believe in the coming of Mashiach is a heretic. 
person can believe, you could be what you call from, he's observant on all the laws of Torah. He doesn't believe Mashiach, he's a heretic. Okay, so the Rambam therefore stipulates, now I'm going to quote from the Rambam, this is my translation of the Rambam, but I'm quoting not my words of the Rambam. Quote, anyone who does not believe in him, Mashiach, okay, or does not anticipate his coming, not only denies the prophets, the prophets talk about Mashiach, but he also denies the, the Torah of Moses, our teacher. These are the words of the Rambam in the Laws of Kings, chapter 11, law one. So our great spiritual leaders throughout history, they anticipated Mashiach and Geula with all their hearts and on a practical level as well. Like you said, you know, with the Shabbat code, the Chafetz Chaim, look what the Chafetz Chaim did. The Chafetz Chaim, he established, the Chafetz Chaim, he could, could learn learned all of Torah, but he made a special rabbinical koilil where they learned Kodshim. Kodshim are the laws that apply to the sacrifices in the Holy Temple and the divine service in the Holy Temple. And few are familiar with these laws on day and basis. But the Chofetz Chaim, he himself was a Kohen from the priestly tribe. He says, I, I better know these because tomorrow Hashem is going to build us a Holy Temple and I'm going to have to serve in the Holy Temple. And it's going to be a super embarrassment if I don't know what's going, what to do. So he gathered, he made it in his Koilans, rabbinical seminary, where people met many Kohanim and Levim that learned this, and predominantly so they would know, be able to know what to do. And the Chafetz Chaim, as far as he says, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, he was expecting tomorrow morning, I'm not going to be praying in synagogue here in Radin. I'm going to be in the base of Mikdash, and I'm going to have to do the ritual sacrifice in the base of Mikdash, I have to know what to do. Okay, so uh, he also had his special festive coat that he planned to greet Mashiach with, and he would don it from time to time, but to make sure, in other words, every, maybe once every day or two, he'd take it out of the closet and air it out so it wouldn't be dusty or moldy, and he'd put it on, make sure that all the buttons were there and make sure everything is fine, and he'd brush the pockets, okay, I look fine, and it's that, then he'd hang it back up. And you know, for him, it was so intimate. He believed this was, it, it, it would anticipate. This is what means anticipating. Not just hoping, oh yeah, I hope Mashiach comes, but anticipating. I have to learn the laws of the Guru. I have to learn the laws of the Holy Temple. I have to learn the laws. Well, well, what's going to be? I have to know what's going to do. And I have to, have, I have to dress properly to, to Mashiach. Imagine uh, you get a wedding invitation. Okay, for the men, it's easier. They put on their white shirt and their suit and they're finished. But look how... Our beloved sisters prepare themselves for a wedding. Why? It's hairdo and it's clothes and it's this and it's that. And not only that, what color, the nail polish and what color earrings and what this. And every single detail, every single detail. Beloved sisters, what are you going to wear to greet Mashiach? I never thought of that. Think about that. You stop and think about what you are going to wear. Set aside, set aside your, your special tichel or your special chap. Set aside something you wear from a shiach, and then you'll be able to say after your 120 years ago, oh yeah, I did. Oh, proof to, proof to us in heavenly court that you took from shiach. You see these gold earrings? You see these gold earrings? These were set aside from a shiach. You didn't see me wearing them during the year. I set them aside. I'm going to put these gold earrings on only when Mashiach comes. This is something, it's something, there's little ways every person on his own. But you can't imagine what lofty divine service this. This is anticipating Mashiach. This is anticipating Mashiach. So the Rambam, okay, with that, this is anticipating in the, in the purest form. Okay, so once again, once again, I'm going to emphasize that this is the fifth time. Anticipation is not speculation and not date guessing. Okay, six times. I promise at least six times. Anticipation is not speculation. The Rambam reiterates that the Gemara's curse against those who speculate on time of Mashiach's arrival, and he codifies, takes from the Gemara, that curse, and the Rambam puts it into, he codifies it in chapter 12 of the Laws of Kings, Law 2. It's codified. Rambam brings it into law. Okay, the speculation, as we learned, is potentially devastating for when it fails to materialize. Many of those who had their hopes held high, they crash, crash land in disappointment, break into smithereens, and they despair at the expense of whatever level of amuna they might have had. Okay, so whereas, seventh time, whereas speculation is a blemish in simple amuna, 
anticipation is not. Even though he tarries, I'll nonetheless await him every day whenever he may come. That's part of our 12th principle. And this is the purest declaration of Imuna. Okay, so now we learn what's going to happen. And now we're going to learn who is Mashiach. Who is Mashiach? So people think what Mashiach is going to be, some miracle worker, and he's going to walk on the water, and he's going to fly up in the air, and he's going to do all kinds of things. No. One of the first things that the Rambam stresses is Mashiach is a human being, just like Adele, just like Eliza Wender, just like Elisheva Burda, just like the Price family, just like the Blumenberg family, just like Ben Jacobs, just like Bobby, it's, 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 just like everybody, just like Yosef Hollingworth, I mean, I mean, Mashiach, parents of flesh and blood, just like Dr. David Dome, flesh and blood. Okay, Mashiach, that's it. Okay, Mashiach may not necessarily run the 100 meters in 10 seconds flat. He's not going to be a track, he's not going to be an Olympic track star. He's not going to be able to, a power lifter to lift up 300 pounds. He's going to be able to spiritually do much more than that. He's going to be able to spiritually, to, on a spiritual level, his prayers. His prayers are like, if you could see in last week's Torah portion in bull, this week's Torah portion, Bishalach, the Moshe Rabbeinu's prayers, what Moshe Rabbeinu's prayers could do, this is what Moshe Rabbeinu would be able to do. Okay, so the Rambam says, and again, I'm quoting the Rambam, don't think that Mashiach must perform miracles and wonders and unprecedented actions in the world or revive the dead and so forth. That's in Laws of Kings, 11th chapter, law number three. The Rambam therefore shows the stark contrast of our concept of Mashiach and other religions' idea of Messiah. So once the Rambam stipulates that Mashiach doesn't have to be a miracle worker, he differentiates between the genuine Mashiach and the false Mashiach. He said, well, how can I know who's the real deal is? How can I, the Rambam will tell you. Okay. Let's see some of the, the characters. We are now going to learn who, and there's two levels of acknowledging Mashiach. The Rambam says like this in 11th chapter, Law 4, the Rambam says, I quote the Rambam, if King Mashiach will arise from the descendants of the house of David and immerse himself in Torah and mitzvah observance, like his forefather David, both written Torah and, Torah and oral Torah, and he leads all of Israel, all of Israel, to lives of Torah and to strengthen themselves in every detail of observance, and he fights the battles of Hashem, then he can re be regarded, I emphasize regarded, we're allowed to regard him as Mashiach. These are the, we're gonna, I'm, I'm going to go and reiterate, reiterate these things, maybe you want to write them down. But I will reiterate the, these what, what, uh, these conditions, these preconditions. Now, if he has done all of we just mentioned, and he succeeded, and in addition he rebuilds the holy temple in its proper place on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and has gathered in the exiles, then he certainly is Mashiach. First level is we regard him as a Mashiach, and by the latter proofs he's certainly Mashiach. Okay, so let's play. Pay close, close attention to the Rambam's differentiation between regarded to be Mashiach and to be certainly Mashiach. We'll compare the two. Okay, there are four conditions in regarding to be Mashiach. We can regard him. Number one, he's got to be a descendant of King David. Number two, he's got to be immersed in Torah and in mitzvah observance. In other words, if somebody comes along and he do a sound and light show, and they're Mashiach, and they do all kinds of miracles and that. But he's walking, and he's got a, a couple of coins in his pocket on Shabbat. No way, you're not Mashiach, because you're not immersed in Torah, and you're not immersed in observance. If he does anything wrong, there's a story about the Taz, Taz Rebbe, David Akuin. Uh, he was a, a great Poisek, he commented to Shulchan Aruch. He sent his son and his son-in-law to Istanbul to check out Shabtai Tzvi, if he's the real deal. And they saw Shabtai Tzvi lying on his back. We say he's cut lying on his back. We're not allowed to lie on our back. Halacha tells us to lie on our sides because if a man lies on his back, he's maybe going to have uh, not clean thoughts. So we lie on our side, not on our back and not on our stomach. He saw us, shop tight's feet, lying on his back. They came back and they said, they said, Dad, that's not Mashiach. 
Well, how do you know? Because he was lying on his back. He said, You're right. That's it. Goes against the Gomorrah. He can't go against the Gomorrah. So he said, number one, he's descended of David. Number two, he's immersed in Torah and in mitzvah observance. Number three, he leads all of Israel to lead lives of Torah. Not just a small group, but everyone, secular and religious, ethnic groups with no obsession. Now, if I extrapolate the Rambam, the Rambam doesn't say this. If I extrapolate on this, okay. Since Emuna is the same mitzvah between Israel and the nations of the world, there's no difference in Emuna. Okay, they have to. We have to believe in Hashem. They have to believe in the same thing. Okay, we have different. We put on tefillin. They don't have to put on tefillin. Okay, and he will fight the battles of Hashem. Mashiach will fight that all the world will accept Hashem. This is what we say in Aleinu. And every, all of living flesh will call, call your name. Ask yourself, how's that supposed to happen? That's Mashiach's battles. Now, some of the nations are going to fight against him. They're not going to, they're not going to want that. <laughs> they're, they're not going to want that. They're, they're, okay. But he's, he's, he's going to fight about that. And Mashiach is going to fight about that. So therefore, I would learn from that, that not only does Mashiach bring the Jewish people to observe Hashem's Torah, that it would bring all of humanity to the seven Noahide laws. Bring all this and Hashem, this is this we can extrapolate that of our third our third condition that Mashiach has to lead all of Israel to live lives of Torah. Number four, he fights all those who raise up against Hashem and in Torah, whether within Israel or outside of Israel. So if Mashiach fulfills those first four conditions, once again, the second David, immersed in Torah, he leads all of Israel's lives of Torah, and he fights Hashem's enemies. And if he does these four conditions, then not totally and not partially, we're obliged to regard him as Mashiach. We cannot regard him as Mashiach. But now he's got to do three more things to be certainly Mashiach. Now this is certain Mashiach with this them certified Certified Mashiach. Number one, he defeats the enemies of Hashem and his Torah. Okay, people can come and they can say from Iran, Mahdi, and, and they could say from uh, from ISIS, uh, Jihad, and they could say from here, and the, and the Crusaders come with, with, with their guy, and Mashiach with his prayers. Rabbi Nachman says Mashiach is going to have a nuclear weapon. Rabbi Nachman says that Mashiach is going to win all his battles with his prayers. His sword is his prayer. Okay, so Hashem, take care of them. And this, when he can accomplish that with his prayers, uh, you, you can see, Hashem could do a whole lot of things, a, a whole lot of things. And play. That we, don't need, we don't need armaments to, to win a war. We need prayer. That number one, Hashem, uh, Mashiach defeats the enemies of Hashem and his Torah. Defeats them, not just fights against them. Regarded, we see him fighting against them. Two, he defeats them. Okay, the first, second, Precondition of be certain Mashiach is he builds the holy temple in its proper place in Jerusalem. Number three, he gathers the exiles from the four corners of the earth to our holy beloved homeland here in the land of Israel. So if he fulfills these three conditions, then he's certainly Mashiach. So clearly, no one in history since King David, King David, he fulfilled all these conditions. King David defeated the enemies of Hashem. And every war, he never lost a war. King David, through his son, built the holy temples, King Solomon. And they gathered in the exiles. was at the time of King Solomon, everybody's here. Then they went away and it came subsequent exile, like the prophet said they would if they were they went into went back into idolatry and went after King Sol King David wasn't here and King Solomon wasn't here. Then the nation slid back, and that brings us to here we are, we're in exile here. So since King David and King Solomon, nobody has been close to fulfilling the prerequisites of regarded to be Mashiach, much less certainly Mashiach. Okay, so now you know what, what, what Mashiach is all about, and you could put it in a proper perspective. All right, so let's ask ourselves, now we go this, what is life going to be when Mashiach, how is life going to change when Mashiach comes? Okay, after the Rambam describes an angel, once again, once again, to prepare tonight's lesson, I almost totally ex exclusively use the Rambam because the Rambam, Maimonides, and his, his 14 volumes of, uh, of Talmudic law, the, is our main source for Mashiach. Okay, 
So once again, the Rambam describes the nature of Mashiach. Up to now, we're talking at the chapter 11 in the Laws of Kings. Now we move to chapter 12 in the Laws of Kings, what's called Ilhot Malachim. And in chapter 12, the Rambam says about what's going to life in the era of Mashiach is going to be like. The Rambam says, and once again, I'm quoting the Rambam, don't think that the natural course of the world will be altered during the time of Mashiach, but nature shall continue to run its course. Okay, that's what the Rambam says. In other words, uh, things as they are now, they're not going to change. A person is still going to have to pay the bank for his mortgage payments. A person is still going to have to pay the electric company monthly electric payments. Farmers are still going to plow fields. We're still going to plant. We're still going to harvest. Okay. And Mashiach will not, sorry, sorry to disappoint anybody, Mashiach will not pay off anybody's credit card bills. Okay. And Mashiach won't pay their dental bills. If you don't brush your teeth and you eat sugary stuff and you get uh, have to have root canals, it uh, does, oh, Mashiach is here. He's going to pay the dental. No. Mashiach says you pay your own dental bills. All right. And there will still be rich people and there'll be poor people and there'll be strong people and there'll be weak people. So what's the difference? What's the difference? Okay. The difference is that the monarchy will return to the house of David and the world will, full, will be filled with the knowledge of Hashem and earning an income will be much, much easier for those that devote their time to divine service. Okay. You say, uh, listen, Roger Price in the UK said, listen, Hashem, I don't have time to run my business. Uh, it, my job, since I'm way before anybody was in the Noah in the UK, I was organizing seminars and doing everything. Okay, Roger Price is going to be the, one of the main Noah teachers in the UK, in the British Isles. Okay, I said, of course, by all means. So he'll have somebody working, and it doesn't matter how many fireplaces he sells or how many stoves he sells. But he's going to have all the income he has up now because he's totally immersed and involved in divine service. This serves the divine. He's teaching the, the British people the, the no-hide laws. Give you a professor. Okay, get ready, Roger. And they had to embarrass Roger, but this is it. And just like I could go down, that a, a lot of you, the, the same thing, the same thing. So the world is going to be filled with divine knowledge and those that help disperse the divine knowledge, like we're trying our best today to, to disperse and Muna all over the world. And for those, it's going to be much easier to learn Torah and your income will come pleasurably because what Hashem is doing is gearing up the world for its ultimate rectification. And then all of Hashem for ultimate rectification, people are going to have to learn the laws of Hashem and that to be able to teach them. Okay, so here's the thing. Now is the time. What do we learn from all this? Okay, how, how do we conclude tonight's lesson? Uh, there is one big disadvantage of the Messianic era up till now, okay? When we still await Mashiach, despite existential threats from Iran, Iran's threatening to wipe it every day, Iran threatening Iran, Hezbollah, and we got the pandemic, but we're still waiting Mashiach. Now, strengthening Amuna, strengthening our faith, we have to go against strong opposition. Now, it's a great stock. If this was the spiritual Wall Street, Emuna is high stock. Once Mashiach comes, the price of Emuna is going to go way down. Chris says, oh, I want to have Emuna. I want to buy an Emuna. Oh, thank you. Now that Mashiach has revealed himself, now that the world is full of knowledge of Hashem, you want to jump on the wagon? Okay. Welcome. Welcome. It's nice. But you really should have done it well, back then when... Uh, you would you learn it when when the Amuna group, the Amuna Hour group was learning the 13 principles of Amuna, you should have been there. Okay. Now I can tell you, beloved brothers and sisters, and I said this last week. I said this last week. You have no idea of the power of what you're doing. I have no idea. And I can tell that if, every every time I, I see it's not not a matter of anything. Everyone who is with us learning Amuna. And I made the promise last week. I reiterate the promise again. For everyone that is learning Amuna with us tonight, and now some of you are looking for a place like Yosef and Sarah, they're doing a, a family thing, and it's a, a, a few people are, are together in a family. Uh, the Callan family, they're together. Okay, then for every person that's learning with us tonight, 
somebody is being taken off a respirator. With that, you even knowing it, you're saving a life. This is because Emuna is helping purify the air. It's helping people breathe spiritually. When they breathe spiritually, they'll breathe physically better. Okay. So the advantage of now is that strength in Emuna is still worth a lot. And the value of Emuna and Shuva is going to be much less uh, after Mashiach comes. So after Mashiach comes, only an imbecile would transgress Hashem's laws. Can you imagine something like walking into the king's palace and shouting out an epithet against the king? What are you, crazy? Suicide? Right away, the palace guards are going to knock it down. So this is what our sages say. Look at what our sages say in the Midrash. They call this the needless days. Yamim Shein Ben Chefetz. They say that once Mashiach comes, there's no reward, no punishment. Everybody can see that's true. It's not going to be a reward for a show. Thank you very much. When you see the miracles in the Holy Temple and the divine presence, oh man, that, that takes away our choice. It takes away our choice. There's no more reward and benefit. So the full benefits of strengthening Amuna and purifying ourselves are right now. Okay. So why then do we yearn for Mashiach if they're going to be worthless days? Because there's no greater sublime pleasure anywhere than getting to know Hashem and getting close to him. And in messianic times, we're going to be on much higher spiritual level and we'll be much closer to Hashem. We will be today on the level above the level of angels. Okay. The days of Mashiach will bring mankind to a spiritual level beyond what we can dream of. Because on that day, thus speaks Hashem, I will put my Torah in their midst and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people for they shall all know me. That's the words in Jeremiah chapter 31. That's the joyous day we all anticipate speedily in our days. Amen.